Up next is an interview with Madeline Feldman, a practicing rheumatologist in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Feldman serves as president of the Coalition of State Rheumatology Organizations, also known as CSRO. Dr. Feldman is one of the most active advocates in the United States with a special expertise in payer practices and formulary construction, the methods by which payers determine which drugs are covered and which aren't. Dr. Feldman has lectured, testified, and provided comments to policymakers, all with the goal of making sure that these policies work for patients. That means not only increased access to these powerful biologic therapies, but that the savings that come from biosimilars are actually passed on to patients. Today, Dr. Feldman is interviewed by Philip Schneider, one of the world's preeminent lecturers on the topic of biosimilars. He's a professor of pharmacy at The Ohio State University and past president of the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the largest pharmacist organization in the United States. He recently completed a term as vice president of the International Pharmacy Federation, and he currently serves as the advisory board chair for the Alliance for Safe Biologic Medicines, who is co-sponsoring this program. Hello, my name is Phil Schneider, and I'm here with a fireside chat with Dr. Madeline Feldman. Uh, so let's start out, Dr. Feldman, by uh, giving us a quick snapshot of the U.S. biosimilars landscape. How are we doing compared to the rest of the world? Well, thanks, Phil, and thanks for having me here. Um, you know, we've only had biosimilars uh, here in the United States since 2015. So that's just seven years. And in those seven years, we've had 33 approvals. So I think that we are, we're pretty successful and we're rapidly moving ahead with um, uh, more and more approvals. Of these, so what happens after a drug is, is approved, it needs to be launched onto the market. So of those 33 approvals, 21 have been launched onto the market now. You know, what holds it up? Well, usually it has to do with patent litigation, patent thickets, but a lot of these that have been held up are expected to hit the market next year in 2023. Now, an important point that we have to look at, the, for the most part, all of the biosimilars that have been launched are on what we call the provider side. Those are the drugs that you either go into the clinic to get, you can go to a cancer center, the hospital, your physician's offices, they're administered by the provider. And then you have the pharmacy side, and those are the ones that you inject yourself. And just recently, we, we have had um, some biosimilar insulins, which are on the pharmacy side, but for the most part, it's been the provider side. And that's going to be an important point when looking at the price considerations and competition for biosimilars. The biggest challenge I think that we're facing in hauling over our system is that the pharmacy side, the access to getting on the, to, the, to those drugs is they have to be on the formulary. And the construction of that formulary is done by um, an entity known as a pharmacy benefit manager. By constructing the formulary, they tell us what drugs our patients can take through the utilization management tools that I'll talk about a little bit later. They basically decide when our patients can get them. They decide the cost share and they set up the, form, uh, the pharmacy networks um, so where our patients can get it. And it's unfortunate because over the years, it's been consolidated down to three pharmacy benefit managers. And those three essentially control the formularies for 80% of the American public. And the problem is, is in constructing the formulary, the bidding by the manufacturers is not on the lowest list price, which would actually help the biosimilars get on the formulary. It actually has to do with a rebate and fees that are based on a percentage of the list price. And the middleman making that formulary actually makes more money for a higher price drug. So we're gonna to have to see what happens when we get over to the pharmacy side next year to see if biosimilars actually will be able to penetrate and get on a formulary. Well, you mentioned insulins. Uh, how are things working with that? It's just recently been approved. It's a very widespread use as a public policy issue. There have been a lot of concerns in federal uh, legislation uh, trying to improve the affordability of this 
life-saving medicine that people need that's been very expensive. Tell us how Ab that's working so far. The insulins actually are on the pharmacy side. And I think we have a really good example of why it's gonna be difficult to get lower priced um, biosimilars onto the formulary. There's a company that made the biosimilar and actually they went, you know, they, they went to the trouble of actually doing interchangeability studies so that their insulin has been shown to be interchangeable with the innovator, with the, uh, with the originator. Um, they made one that was high priced and they made one that was low priced. Both are biosimilars, both are interchangeable. Unfortunately, only the higher priced interchangeable bi uh, biosimilar insulin is able to get onto the formulary. Now, as a rheumatologist, practicing rheumatologist, you use biologics and biosimilars in your practice. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with, uh, with these medicines? Absolutely. Um, these, as, as I was stating before, are on the provider side. These are actually infused in my office. I use it to treat rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, and um, the, the ones with, that have come out in terms of biosimilars are predominantly for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. And I have seen the prices that I have to buy the, the medication for drop at least 50%. Um, so the, the biosimilars have been very successful in lowering the average sales price. What happens on the provider side, as, peop, as, as newer drugs come on and are competing with the innovator, and if their price is lower, the average sales price drops. So then I am able to actually purchase it for a lower price. And it's been very, very successful. Great. You mentioned that uh, biosimilars create comp price competition. Uh, shouldn't this competition result in lower priced biologics being chosen for a formulary? That doesn't make sense to me. No, and uh, it, it shouldn't make sense to you. You know, <laughs> competition can do two things. You know, think about it if you're building a house and all of the contractors pretty much the quality is the same. No one's your sister's brother's cousin's boyfriend. So no one has you know, an advantage in terms of quality. So when the bidding takes place, for the most part, competition will lower the, uh, the price of, of, of building your house and because you're gonna tend to pick the lowest price if all things are equal in terms of quality. Now think about it if you're selling your house and you've got that one house on the market that everybody wants and there's that one day where everybody puts in their what their highest bid. So competition um, to get that house actually raises the price of the house. So in that case, competition is raising the price. And unfortunately, um, the competition to get on the formulary here in the US is actually based on the highest price because it's the highest price that can give the middleman who constructs the formulary the most money. So the more competition, the higher the price goes. And again, that puts biosimilars behind the eight ball because first off, they have no market share to be able to control the formulary. And secondly, their whole reason for being is because they have a lower price. And when we see that formularies are constructed with higher priced medications, it makes it very, very difficult. And it's not a question that we don't have enough competition. It's just the competition to get on the formulary tends to give the advantage to the higher priced drug. Well, if any costs are ever saved, as uh, unlikely as it seems that, that is, uh, is there any way for patients to benefit from cost savings that might result from uh, competition in this market? I think so. Um, one thing that I hope that once the, you know, sort of the pharmacy side uh, self injectables opens up, perhaps it'll educate people into thinking maybe we should create formularies in a different way. One of the problems with the provider side, and it, this, this goes back to the health insurance companies again. Now the provider side drugs tends to, tend to be paid for with your medical insurance. And then the drugs you go pick up at the drugstore are paid with your pharmacy benefits. So the ones that are on the provider side, one of the problems that I've run into is that I'll have a patient on a particular biologic innovator and the insurance company can come in and tell me, I have to switch the patient to a biosimilar. And then the next year they may come back and say, no, now you have to go back to the innovator. And then the next year they come and say, oh, now you have to go to biosimilar number two. There is no rhyme or reason for that, except that 
the health insurance company may be making more money on one drug versus another. And there are many, many doctors out there that have absolutely no problem with starting patients on biosimilars. And even maybe even one switch, um, we only have one really big study that has, has shown um, one switch here in the US and I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, but the way it looks like it's, it's kind of ending up is that I've had patients had to go from innovator to biosimilar number one, and now this year they're being forced onto biosimilar number two. And it's kind of turning into what I had said before the FDA years ago, the great American switching experiment. And I'm not sure that's a good thing. So this is a term that uh, I hear called non-medical switching. They're switching that's done because of a, an insurance policy or a, 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 not, not a, a physician's judgment. So. Um, what kind of concerns should we have about this practice of non-medical switching? And what, what concerns should there be for not just physicians, for the patients that you're taking care of? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very controversial topic. Now, when you switch from uh, an innovator or originator biologic medication to a biosimilar, um, there probably isn't as much concern, but I can tell you there's a lot of GI doctors out there, rheumatologists out there that are saying, you know, why, you know, we've got a patient who's stable. It's taken us maybe a year to get them stable. Why even take that outside chance that they may not respond as well to the biosimilar? And I think when you look at physicians, there's, there's, I think there's going to be differences of opinion, um, certainly between different kinds of specialties. Um, when it comes to provider administered, it, it becomes a, you know, sort of an inventory issue. If every formulary for every different health insurance has a different provider administered drug, that means all of those drugs need to be stored. And if there's only one health insurance uh, company that'll pay for, say, biosimilar number one, and then that patient get, gets sick or doesn't tolerate it, then that there's a lot of wastage. That biosimilar one just has to get tossed because none of the other patients can take it. So you can see it gets very, very complicated when we get into the, um, the non-medical switching. Again, starting naive patients on biosimilars, whether it's for cancer or rheumatoid arthritis or any of the other um, medications or disease states that have uh, biosimilars, I would think that most physicians don't have a problem with it. It's when you get that first switch, maybe, okay. Um, but when you start talking about multiple switches, um, you know, we really start getting worried. As I said, they did have a, a, a couple of years ago, the Veterans um, Administration System here in the hospital um, made a switch from an originator infliximab to a biosimilar infliximab. And recently there was a study within the last few months that did show that those patients that were switched um, were three times more likely to have to switch back or actually get on a different drug than those patients who were able to stay on the same drug. And of those patients that had to switch, 91% of them ended up going back to the originator drug. You know, unfortunately, the authors could not figure out for some reason um, why they couldn't give the reason as to why those patients who were switched were three times more likely to have some issues. Mm. Okay. Are there other ways that uh, payers can steer patients to, to preferred products and restrict access to non-preferred products or less profitable products? Yes, and how they do that is, is known as utilization management tools. And it's exactly what, what it sounds like. They manage the utilization of medications um, by these various tools. And there's a number of them. Prior authorization is actually a utilization management tool. Oftentimes it is used to delay a patient's ability to get the correct medicine. And if it's for a medicine that they don't want you to take, um, because perhaps, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, you haven't failed the right number of medications, um, that delay can actually um, cost the patient more money and actually it, it costs them um, in terms of their health as well. And there are some very good studies showing how prior authorization hurts patients. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. The, the, the one that we're probably very, very familiar with is called step therapy or fail first. 
and how they manage the utilization of drugs is that they steer patients towards what they call the lowest net cost drug. And then of course, non, uh, non-medical switching is when say, for example, a patient is on, and we'll use the, you know, the example of a biologic, they're on an originator and then the very next year, the originator is tossed off or you have to fail one or two biosimilars before you can get to the, um, you know, back, back, to, back to the originator. So it's kind of a combination. So non-medical switching happens when step therapy changes the formulary. And unfortunately, uh, for the most part, every six months, this can happen. So a patient will sign up for a particular health insurance plan seeing that the drug that has you know, made their, their rheumatoid arthritis stable, um, six months into the plan, they can just drop that and put a different drug in place. So it's, it's a bad system for a number of reasons. You know, It harms patients by switching them off of the medications that they're stable on. And then it doesn't necessarily go to a lower price drug. The patient's cost share for these expensive drugs is a percent of the list price of the drug. So we have an upside down competition system here, and that is going to, going to work against those biosimilars that are on the pharmacy side. So is all this switching leading to savings across our health system at least? I think so, certainly on the provider side. Um, as I said, the, the, the originator infliximab has gone down at least for what I can purchase it for um, almost 50%. And so consequently, um, patients will, have, will get to pay less. So yes, when you extrapolate that out over how many patients and over how many years, you know, some of the estimates are in the billions of dollars, but it remains to be seen if on the pharmacy side, that same thing's going to happen. Because remember, there's an average sales price that providers um, buy these, these drugs for, or at least get reimbursed. Um, but on the pharmacy side, and Phil, you, you probably know this. I mean, there are no prices. It's just the highest kickback. I mean, we can call it a rebate plus fees, but we can also call it a kickback because they wouldn't need safe harbor from the anti-kickback statute if it wasn't a kickback. So I think it's going to be, you know, I hesitate to use the word exciting, but I think it's going to be pretty exciting when we see a number of biosimilars to adalimumab which uh, the originator for adalimumab is, is the most widely used drug for rheumatoid arthritis and brings that manufacturer lots of money. So we're going to see what happens when those adalimumab biosimilars come out next year. Well, it's a complicated market, as you point out. Uh, but in, in a few words, what kind of reforms do you, would you like to see uh, in the U.S. system? Well, I mean, the first thing I'd like to see is, you know, I, I've always said we don't have a drug pricing crisis. We have a formulary construction crisis, because if we if we would construct formularies utilizing competition that lowers the prices, meaning the efficacy of the drug, the safety of the drug and the lowest list price, not the highest kickback, we would have competition and a race to the bottom in prices. And that would help the patient because their coinsurance, as, as I said, for these specialty drugs is based on, on um, a percent of the list price. Unfortunately, um, if that can't happen, I mean, that would disrupt the entire system. These three big PBMs, and now they're all vertically integrated with three large health insurance companies are extremely powerful. And I can't see them letting that happen because so much money is made on formulary construction. So at the very least, patients should pay their co-insurance on the, I guess, the, the, the list price minus the rebate and the fees. What the middleman ended up paying for the drug the patient should get the benefit of that. It's not even a discount, but should get the benefit of that post rebate, post price concession price. Um, the other thing is if a patient is stable on a medication, they should be allowed to stay on that medication. Um, if we see that we can reduce the price burden in the United States by mandating biosimilars First, for naive patients, if we can show that that will actually, you know, reduce healthcare costs, again, I don't have a problem with that 
because biosimilars have been shown to be clinically equivalent to the, uh, to the innovator. So if you're starting the patient on it and we can show that it will actually reduce costs, that's fine. Switching a stable patient, that remains to be seen, particularly if they're gonna be switched to a drug that's a higher price. Well, our audience is, uh, is uh, patient advocates. And so what can patient advocates do to help move things in that direction to ensure access to biosimilars without jeopardizing their care? I think one of the things that in terms of just not jeopardizing their care, um, I, I think would be to, there, there are transparency um, pieces of legislation, both in the state and on the federal level that will help shed light on why higher price drugs are chosen. And oftentimes when you shine a light on a problem like that, um, there's a better chance of getting it fixed. So if we really wanna see the benefit of the lower prices of the biosimilars, um, we first have to shine the light on why they're not being chosen. Why is it that an insulin biosimilar that's interchangeable and lower priced than the higher priced biosimilar interchangeable is not on the, on the formulary. So transparency would be one thing. Um, there's something called rebate pass-through so that any kind of discount that is given to the middleman would actually be passed on to the patient. Um, and I think in terms of stability, uh, there are step therapy, there, there's, a, there's a federal step therapy piece of legislation called the Safe Step Act. And that is probably going to be um, debated hotly and hopefully will pass. There's co-sponsors on both sides and that will allow patients who are stable to remain on their medication. And if it's a biosimilar, the patient won't be forced back onto the originator or they won't be forced onto a different one each every six months. Um, so that would be one thing. And then of course the states have lots of legislation both in transparency, non-medical switching, um, step therapy. And I think if we keep the patient as the, as the focus of what is best for the patient, because ultimately the patient is the consumer, I think things will work out. Unfortunately, the patient has not been the focus of, of, of formulary construction. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you, Dr. Feldman. We encourage all of our patient advocates to take a look at our patient advocacy toolkit for ways that they can be informed about and get active uh, in biosimilar policymaking in their country, region, or even internationally. In addition, we encourage patient advocacy organizations to stay informed by considering joining some of the international organizations, such as the Alliance for Safe Biologic Medicines, the Global Colon Cancer Association, and the World Patient. Uh, Alliance. And thank you very much for listening to our program. And thanks, Dr. Feldman. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Feldman, for your insights into formulary construction and the challenges patients are facing in the U.S. While Dr. Feldman practices in the U.S., these concerns are universal whenever a third-party payer gets involved in treatment decisions, and we can all learn from each other's experiences. It is critical that the policies surrounding biosimilars do not undermine the control a patient has over his or her condition. Patient advocacy organizations have a huge role to play in achieving that, but education is key, and that's why we're offering this program. <laughs>